Hey, 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 Soul Tribe. Welcome back. This is episode 2.6 of Beyond Deconstructing. I'm your host, Peter Jamaica Pogue, affectionately known as Deconstructing Neuro. Thank you guys for coming back and stopping by, spending a little bit of time with me today. This episode is going to be a little bit different. It's not another double episode like you guys got last week, but instead of doing TikTok therapy, I'm going to be doing a neural spicy rumination. And for those of you who follow me on YouTube, if you don't, I highly suggest it. But for those who do, you may be familiar with my neural spicy rumination series. And it's where I kind of go off on a tangent, exploring some dots that I've connected with my spider web thinking and sometimes it includes life updates but today it's going to be a neuro spicy rumination rant something that's really been making my ass itch lately is thinking about how much has uh, how much projection from allistic especially neurotypical people has been injected into the deficits based view of autism, right? And there's so many aspects that I could touch on, but the one that I really want to touch on is black and white thinking, all or nothing thinking, how that is defined from the holistic point of view, why they see it as a negative, and how it's really a projection of how they think, right? So the first fold, if you, or the first hand, if you're not you're not familiar with how it's defined from an holistic view. The black or white thinking is defined as a deficit, and they say that we have inflexible morals. We have rigid thinking, right? And it's defined as a deficit because they see it from a very one-dimensional place. They see us, you know, very, having very rigid ideas of what we uh, believe in and what we don't believe in, what we support and what we don't support, being very strongly um rooted in our ideals and our beliefs, right? And so not falling victim to or not necessarily even being perceptive to kind of passive um, manipulation tactics and like just standing 10 tones down in what we believe and what, you know, whether it's good or bad, we're not talking about it. We're talking about it from a neutral standpoint. That's what they mean. That's how they define it, right? And again, it's seen as a, a negative or a deficit because in neurotypical culture um, and society and the way they think and what is culturally acceptable is that passive implications are the way to communicate. So if you are somebody who doesn't pick up on those passive implications or those passive implications don't motivate you to act in a certain way and you have very strong uh, beliefs and ideals and, you know, you stand tensos down in your stance, that to them works out to being just this defiance, this inability to comply, which in neurotypical society is a huge no-no. But the second part is defining it from the autistic point of view, right? What they don't realize is that a majority of the time, the reason why we can be so rigid in what we believe is because we've absorbed a lot of data points and have come to a conclusion that is well informed. Now, again, we're not talking about whether it's morally right, socially right, or whatever. We're talking about in neutral terms, whatever the ideal or the belief is, um, usually from an, the autistic person is going to have had an amalgamation of information, an amalgamation of data points that they've uh, absorbed that has informed their decision and informed their stance. Um, but you don't, the, the holistic people, the neurotypical people, they don't see that process happening, right? All they see is you making that decision. All they see is you not falling victim to their passive implications and manip manipulation. You not taking or internalizing their statements and their pressures um, to change your stance. That's all they see. They don't see the fact that, well, I'm not going to just change at a whim because you're trying to pressure me because I have, you know, a myriad of reasons as to why I actually believe what I believe. But we always know that those who are in power, quote unquote, are the ones who get to shape the narrative. So 
they most of the time don't even ask the why behind the what. They see the what, they give it a definition based off of their point of view, and then they define it as a negative, as a deficit. And that is a perfect transition into why this whole phenomenon fucks me up. Because their definition of all or nothing or black or white thinking or or assuming that all we do is just like stick to things and don't change or have like an inflexible cognition or whatever the fuck way you want to define it really actually defines their way of thinking because a lot of what they do is making assumptions based off of preconceived like acceptable scenarios. It's like, um, if then, if this, then that, and they don't really take in the nuances. They don't look for like the small differences that could play different factors in changing how this scenario actually may be, right? And I actually made a video about this not too long ago where I said that I feel like autistic people want to understand other people, whereas allistic, especially neurotypical people, just want to figure you out. Because those two things are very different. Trying to understand someone is it involves empathy. It involves you actually taking the time to get to know this person as an individual, learn more about them as a person, learn more about their experience, take all of that information and put it together to come to a conclusion, bottom up thinking, right? But figuring someone out is top down thinking. You come to a conclusion based off of very little information and then everything else gets funneled through that conclusion. So based off of whatever stereotypes or whatever kind of beliefs have already been culturally or societally ingrained into you becomes the filter through which you start to view other people. And you don't take in any additional details a lot of the time before you've already, quote unquote, figured them out, put them into a category And then that's how you just treat them. You don't actually treat them as an individual or see the nuances in their um, experiences and who they are. And to me, that is truly black and white thinking, because if you can just come to a conclusion that takes damn near fucking heaven and earth to get you to change your mind, if people are willing to move through the cognitive dissonance that occurs when your beliefs are challenged, if you are able to just look at somebody and jump to a conclusion and just like fight every inclination uh, or every instance of, you know, contradictory information coming your way. Like to me, that is more black and white thinking than having had all of this information coming to a conclusion because you've taken in and considered all this different nuance and then feeling very strongly about that opinion because you know it's well-informed, it's shaped based off of a multitude of information, not based off of these snap judgments that somebody just made because they assumed a bunch of shit about you. But it's so funny when you talk to neurotypicals, they literally don't see themselves that way. They think, oh no, like we're able to see people as individuals, like everybody is different, we're this, that, and the other, but they don't actually realize that they do the exact opposite of what they assume they're doing. When you quote unquote figure somebody out, that's not you knowing what's up or you just having good discernment. That's you making a bunch of fucking assumptions before you even like had an opportunity to get to know who this person is. Like Again, we talk. I can I can bring up so many stereotypes that have been placed upon me as an example, right? I am a fat black woman, right? There are so many stereotypes about us that are largely negative. So most of the time, when people approach me, if they have any kind of like internalized bias against any of my intersections, it shows very immediately in how they approach me. Um, when I used I used to tell this story a lot. When I used to drive for Lyft. I used to hate picking up young white guys because they were primarily the people who exposed what they like, how they think. They saw me, made a snap judgment and started to act a very fucking obnoxious way. Right. I had several times where they started putting on a black set. And be like, "Okay, baby girl, you need to turn that meat meal on. Why you got this on? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you serious? You know nothing about me. You just got in my fucking car, but you saw a fat black woman and assumed that I was going to be loud and wanted to play all this fucking hip hop. And then I wanted to be called baby girl and, and that it was okay to put on a black skin and blah, blah, blah. Like, 
And I drove for Lyft for like four years. This was a fucking common occurrence. This is not something that happened once or twice, and I'm exaggerating. I drove for fucking Lyft and Uber for four fucking years, and I hated every time I realized that I was picking up a bunch of young white guys because the majority of the time, I would say at least 70% of the time, there was some kind of microaggression from the you know, subtle to the fucking overt. And that's just one of many kind of examples that I could pull out. But I'm just, I brought that up to just kind of like illustrate the point. It's like, that's how a lot of people really are, um, whether they realize it or not. But it's, it's especially a feature I'm finding of neurotypical culture is to just quote unquote, figure people out. And you don't realize that that is not you understanding other people. That is you making assumptions and projecting. And this also leads to why there are people who can just like believe that a whole group, a whole ethnic group could just inherently be animals. Because if you've been indoctrinated to believe that, hey, if you believe this religion or if you look like this, you're just dangerous or you're just prone to violence. And so you see those people not as people, but as literally a monolith. And one bad action or bad actions from a group of people then now get projected onto the entire people group. And it's like, well, when you try to explain that to someone who has that kind of mentality and that mindset, they don't, the cognitive dissonance literally makes them like fucking glitch and malfunction and they'll just dig their heels in and be like, no, well, they just are. I believe it. They just are. You prove to me that they are. And then you get into these stupid fucking arguments that actually don't have any point or any merit simply because the cognitive dissonance, the discomfort of of one of your core beliefs being interrupted and, and uh, contradicted by facts, empirical evidence, right? makes you feel like you're being attacked as a person. So now it becomes a fight as opposed to being a productive conversation. So yeah, I guess this uh, recently has been my Roman empire or whatever the fuck, because I have not been able to stop thinking about it for like the last week and some change. It's like, yeah, like holistic neurotypicals in particular, they really like, firstly, it already fucks me up that autism is a quote unquote deficits based disorder in their eyes. That's how it's officially Um, described. Um, And I always fight against that. I feel like deficits should be replaced with differences because it's not a deficit. It's only a deficit and it's only a disabling in a society that that uses the medical model of disability and dismisses us as subhuman and not um, just a natural variant of human expression. But yeah, how people can really like miss the fo- the fact that they're like projecting so much onto us just because they don't take the time to actually understand the why behind the what they see us making strong stances and, and really sticking behind our beliefs and being inflexible to manipulation and non-empirical evidence as you know a deficit and then they see their ability to just go with the flow and listen to the loudest person in the room and you know not really <laughs> challenge anything or like think about the why behind the what they see that as what is it should be and what we're doing is wrong and, and it needs to be seen as a deficit so that you can be more holistic, more neurotypical. And I'm I'm fucking over it. And one other thing I just wanted to add, I feel like okay. I know that this doesn't stand for every freaking body, but a lot of autistic people that I know, myself included, if you're able to explain the logic and back that logic up with empirical evidence, then a lot of the times we do have the ability to like work through that cognitive dissonance and and see the new point of view, right? Um, I'll give you an example. Oh, Shit, yeah, this came to me. Take us self-diagnosed, late-diagnosed autistics, right? A lot of us went decades believing, having core beliefs about who we are, being firmly rooted in those identities, 
right? And then one day you get hit with this new data point, this new information that challenges your core belief. And a lot of us, myself included, you may, in that initial cognitive dissonance, it's challenging a core belief, mm, there's a rejection to it. But over time, if you keep getting more and more irrefutable evidence that supports the logic that you're fighting because it doesn't feel good, eventually you have to start to explore that logic. And even again, if it if it contradicts the core belief, if the logic is there and the math is mathing, all the pieces are there, you're eventually going, if, especially if you're autistic and you have a, a need for things to make sense, if it makes sense, even if it goes against something that you previously held as a core belief, that new information will, will be absorbed. And will help to reframe and reshape how you see things. And I just don't see that happening as much on the other side. With all the six, especially um, neurotypical people, they like, it seems like they, they have this just staunch refusal to see things other than the way that they see them. Because that cognitive dissonance hurts and people will do anything to avoid pain, whether it's physical pain or psychological, emotional pain. Even if that means that they, if they, they remain stagnant and they don't grow, or they continue to perpetuate harm against themselves or others. If they don't, if they can do something to avoid the discomfort, which, you know, in, in this case, in this argument is stick by their stance and refuse to take in evidence that refutes it, then that's kind of how we remain where we are. Um, but I, I'm a, I'm gonna end it there and I'm gonna just pose it, the question to you guys. Who do you think based off of this neurospicy rumination rant, really truly has the black and white, the rigid thinking. Is it autistic people or is it neurotypical people? All right, you guys, I'm super excited to bring you guys today's guest, Desiree, a.k.a. Desi the Artist. Desi is not just the creator of lifestyle and conceptual portraits, but she's also a transformative force. And she uses her platform to help reshape the way we perceive art, identity, and autism. So as an artist, Desi tells stories that resonate deep within the human experience. Her journey is more than just brushstrokes on canvas. It's a profound exploration of identity. She proudly identifies as a queer, Black, late-diagnosed autistic woman, a combination that adds a unique layer to her artistry. Her platform serves as a beacon of awareness, shining a light on the intersectionality of autism, queerness, and race. And through her work, she dismantles stereotypes and fosters a more inclusive and understanding world. So if you couldn't tell already, I am so excited to share this conversation with you guys. I had so much fun talking to Desi, and I hope you guys enjoy it as well. I am very excited to bring you guys today's guest, Desi, the artist, Desiree. So excited to have you here with me today. I am always going to turn it over to you because you can ex introduce yourself and explain who you are a lot better than me. So Desi, take it away. Hi, I'm Desi, the artist. I am a neurodivergent content creator on TikTok, um, and I'm just out here living my life putting it on display for everyone to see kind of as authentically but artistically as possible. I love that. Absolutely love that. And um, before we get into what you're currently doing on TikTok and how you are representing yourself in the autistic community, I would love for you to share your experience with my audience of how you came to understand that you are autistic and the path you've taken to get to a point where you're comfortable with expressing yourself authentically in front of the internet? <laughs> well, um, it's been a long journey, a 35-year journey getting here. Um, 
kind of growing up, you know, autism for a black woman, that's that's not a word. Black girls in the late 80s and 90s were not autistic. That was not a thing. <laughs> um, so I just knew I was different than everybody else. You know, I hung out with everybody, but couldn't quite connect. And you're just growing up and, and people are saying things around you. You don't really understand, but you're trying to, you know, you know, there's something that doesn't quite click all the time. Um, so kind of went through my life for oof, 30 years in this cloud of knowing something just wasn't quite curling over. I was missing something. Just knew I was missing something. Um, was going through relationships and just knew the things that were happening in my relationships were something I wasn't quite understanding. Um, so I went through a divorce a few years ago. Oh, ooh, wow. I say a few years ago, but it's like a while ago now, <laughs> right before I turned 30 and just decided, you know what? Um, I spent a long time trying to be who everybody wanted me to be. I'm just going to be me. Not knowing anything about autism at the time. I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I've spent too long um, trying to be what everybody else wanted me to be. I'm tired. Um, I had an incident where I almost wasn't here anymore. And I was like, I can't. That's, you know what? That We can't do that. We've just got to live authentically. Um, with that, I started a new relationship and um, I saw that my partner was so um, comfortable with themselves, very um, comfortable in their bodies and comfortable with people in a way that I just could not relate to. And I wanted to so bad, but mm -hmm. could not relate to it at all. Um, and I was like, OK, I'm going to get on TikTok. And all these kids are dancing and I'm going to get in touch with my body. And, you know, I'm an artist. I'm going to put my stuff out there. And that algorithm took a hold of me. <laughs> I was like, baby girl, let me show you some things. <laughs> and um, I saw creators um, uh, like uh, Gene Lee and Ricky and a lot of other autistic creators that moved and talked and had similar experiences to me. And I'm like, Ruh -ruh. you know, um, <laughs> I had pretty much figured out because I can't, you know, keep a cabinet door closed to save my life. I, I lose things constantly. You know, ADHD has pretty much um, been accepted in society. I think at this point, for the most part, people kind of understand what's going on. But that autism was a woo moment. I was like, there's no way. Ain't no way. Couldn't be. So um, kind of fought it for a while and went through a lot of research, just constantly all day reading research papers, uh, other uh, autistic people's experiences. And then I looked at my fiance at the time, she's not my wife. And I was like, I'm going to take this red czar. <laughs> I'm going to take this red czar. And if I get a number higher than 100, we're just going to call it. You know what? I'm just going to accept it for what it is. And I took it and I'm taking the test next to her and I'm asking her all these questions. And she's like, you're thinking too deep about it. And I was like, I feel like that's part of the test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, got my number back. It was like 173 or something like that the first time I took it. And I was like, OK, it's time to do some. The more reading and discovery and the more I knew, the more things started clicking into place and. My world just made complete sense. You know, it was just a warm hug, <laughs> just figuring <laughs> it out. And now I'm here and I'm like, I, I got to let everybody know, like, this is what autism can look like. It doesn't have to look like the way we've seen it depicted on television, because all I knew was, you know, skinny white boy who can't talk. You know, that's that's autism. You know, he doesn't like to be touched. He can't look you in the face that's autism. That's all I knew. And that's what I think a lot of people uh, know autism to be. So I'm out here just wanting to be myself as a face of something different, something different to be seen. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that. Like, you know, I highly, highly relate to that journey, but I'm glad the last point that you brought up, um, the face of autism, that's actually the term that I use is the face of autism, because I feel like that is one of the main factors that has kept not only us, but people who are trained in the medical field and in the psychology field 
from seeing us as autistic as opposed to pathologizing all of our individual presentations and um you know explaining in a way as just a behavioral disorder them not seeing us through an intersectional lens has completely overshadowed so many people from understanding that their brains are autistic absolutely absolutely you know um when i was first talking about it with people people were like well do you feel some type of way that you know your mother never got you tested for anything and i was like my mother was you know like 20 in the 90s do you I have no aspersions that she even knew what to look for or ask about, you know, at that time. I'm 35 and just figuring this out in 2023. Like, mom's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And I mean, that grace is something that we have to give to our caretakers and as well to ourselves when we are starting to deconstruct our our processes um, or our experiences to understand that we are autistic. And so I actually wanted to ask you, was there a major catalyst um, that that drove you into seeking that autism diagnosis? I know you, you explained that you always kind of felt different, but was there like a moment or a social situation that just was like, you know what, I think I need to look into autism or at least start to explore why my brain is different? Um, really it was coming into my current relationship. Um, I am a person who, I'm I'm a chronic monogamist. (laughs) Um, I I do best with a a buddy, I say. (laughs) So, um, my situation was I was in a relationship at like 16 and just kept being in a relationship with someone until I was 30. So everything that I knew was based Based on being in heterosexual relationships at that. Um, When I got into this relationship um, with my wife, I could kind of see where I was missing some of those uh, socialization things that come with uh, being a woman and being a black woman and, and being in society and being social and things like that. And I'm like, okay, I see how this is supposed to go. I can really see what I, what my partners were saying I wasn't doing. Because she was doing all the things. They were like, why don't you do this? Why are you doing that? I was like, oh, my gosh. I, I wasn't doing any of this. This what this looks like. Oh, my God. Um, and so I was like, oh, oh, okay, well, I'm me. I'm not this. But what is this? Like, I need to figure out what what's stopping me from being like everyone else. Because it's it's a hindrance. I'm like, what what's blocking me? Um, and she and I were having a conversation one day about something that I had did. And I realized through the course of my relationship, I was giving her my autistic symptoms, right? I didn't know I was autistic, but I was like, hey, you know, when I say something, I'm probably going to offend you at some point in a conversation. I was like, I have no malice behind it. I promise you, I don't. I was like, if you ever offended by anything I say, stop me immediately and tell me because I promise you I have no malice or... um It was one time she, uh, I wanted something picked up from a restaurant, uh, Huey's. And there's plenty of Huey's around town, you know, a little burger situation. But there's a particular Huey's that does my burger exactly the way I like it. The only one I order from. And she's like, why did you order from there when it's 15 minutes away from this? This one's five minutes. And I was like, no, 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 no. no. It's very particular. I need my burger to taste like, you know. (laughs) But why? Like. So then I realized all these little things that I was like, well, it's just how I, I move was not the norm for, you know, what was going on. So that's really the catalyst of figuring out what's going on. I was like, I want to keep my relationship. I need to figure out how we can come together. Let me learn myself some. And she gave me the space, which I am so grateful for, to learn who I was so I could be a better person in our relationship. That's awesome. And yes, those interpersonal connections, when you have the support of someone who's willing to not only understand you, but help you understand you. um, I feel like that is such a blessing, especially along the journey of trying to figure out your own brain when no one has given you the language to help you along that journey. Yeah, it's a lot to unfold as you start. Uh, Cause you know, the beginning of your journey, you're going back through every single um, interaction you've ever had with the person in your life. <laughs> when mm-hmm. you first 
like, oh my God, they thought I was an asshole this whole time. <laughs> like they were... Girl. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I realized in retrospect that somebody thought I was being a complete and total bitch when I was just like, I'm the kind, I'm kind, I'm a teddy bear. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, but then, you know, with that, it kind of, um, at some point it kind of gets isolating, you know, because it's like, do you either want to be your authentic self and have people thinking you're a bitch or do you like leave people alone and they think you're... Uh, uh, you know, obtuse. They're like, oh, she's too good. You know, she's she's above. She doesn't want to talk to us. And it's like, I do want to talk to y'all. However, if I do talk to y'all, y'all are going to have aspersions about me that aren't true because you don't know everything that's going on. You know, it's, it's a give and take. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I love the point that you just made um, because um just as a little background, like that was literally the catalyst for me that like helped me to understand that I'm different because I was just showing up as my authentic self, but I was getting weird reactions from people. And then it made me withdraw into myself because I'm like, well, I don't want to talk to you if you're going to, you know, make fun of me or make you feel awkward about what I said. But then now that I'm not talking to you, people think I think I'm too good. And so um, I bring that up to say, like, do you think that that also has something to do with us being black women and how we have been socialized as firstly as women to be amenable to people and to be nice. But then as black women in this society, that anytime we are direct or confident, it's automatically seen as aggression. I yes, I it's it has a lot to do with that. You know, I, I'm in Memphis. I'm in the South. We are a very chocolate city. Um, but that does not mean that there is not racism in every corner and just, um, ways of being looked at that are unfair and, you know, stemmed in racism. And I'm a six foot tall, dark skinned black woman. I have a presence, even when I don't want to, I do not like being perceived, but people notice you, um, so a lot of times my voice is small. When I'm at work, my voice is very quiet because I work around a lot of, um, to be blunt, young white women um, who, if you elevate your voice, even the slightest tears, and we know how white women tears happen. Like what mm -hmm. happens when white women start? You make sure you keep your voice low. You make sure you say, think about everything you're about to say before it comes out of your mouth. You rewrite an email. 45 times because you're like, this word might be taken out of context. Let me say it this way, even though you're saying the exact same thing, <laughs> you know, um, you can't question and push back. You know, as an autistic person, I am confused a lot. And simply being a black woman asking a question is seen as aggression that I am combating you, that I am trying to one up you or make you look small. It's like, no, I just, I don't understand. And I need you to elaborate. Now, if you can't elaborate because you don't know what you're talking about, that's what you <laughs> Right. <laughs> that's such a perfect point. Yes. Like um, a lot of autistic people, we need it to make sense. Like whether you have PDA or not, just being a very logical thinker, um, if someone gives you a vague instruction or they say something and they leave it open to interpretation, if we need it to make sense in order to be able to do it, for some reason, it just always comes across, especially if you're a Black woman, as you're challenging the hierarchy or you're being insubordinate. And um, I think that really does play into the lack of of that, that it plays a big factor in the lack of people recognizing our actual struggles and see, as opposed to uh, attributing it to some kind of behavioral issue. Oh, she's just an angry black woman. But no, I'm just advocating for something that I need, you know? Right. Right. Um, luckily, this is the first um, job I've had since, you know, understanding my autism and everything. Like the first new job, because I found out in my last job and I was like, this is not going to work. Let me find something else. Um, and knowing that I had autism really helped me get through the initial struggles of figuring out a new job and a new place and everything like that. Um, but with knowing it, being able to advocate for myself, it's been amazing. 
amazing. My manager is uh, a black woman as well. And um, recently she found out through my TikTok because now people who know me are starting to find me and I don't like it. Um, I don't <laughs> like it. But, you know, I'm getting used to it, but it makes me feel all... So she's like, well, I know you have autism. You know, I, I want to help you, you know, grow in this job and be comfortable. And she's like, I see you already keep your lights out when you're at the desk. Like, you don't let anybody turn your lights on. She's like, that's fine. That's fine. That's great. Because I just did it. I didn't ask if I could do it. I was like, you know what? Let me just see what I can get away with. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's like, yeah, that's fine. You know, I was like, I know about the meltdowns and stuff like that. She's like, I have my office. If you want to come in here and turn out the lights and everything like that. And it just, it made me feel human. Mm. For the first time in a long time. Um, because as a Black woman, you know, you have to be 10 times better than everybody else to get at this far. You know, my mother told me that from a very young child, and she was not wrong. <laughs> she was not wrong. Um, so with that and the autism, I just, I felt like I had to be perfect. Like everything I had to do had to be immaculate. Like I had to present myself perfectly. Everything I said had to be perfect. If someone misunderstood me, I had to like do everything I could to make sure that they understood me correctly. Um, but with her coming to me and being like, you know, mistakes happen, I'm your man, just don't worry about it, you're not gonna get fired. Just, you know, like it just made me feel like a human being and not some automaton or some alien who was sent from another planet and put into this body and was like, you need to figure this out <laughs> for your <laughs> own survival. Either figure out how to be a human or die, essentially. Um, but yeah, just those small things that people can do in your life to make you feel human are awesome. Absolutely. That's a perfect segue into accommodations and um, self-advocacy. So a after discovering your diagnosis, how has that impacted not only your sense of self, but your sense of agency and your ability to advocate for yourself and put accommodations in place or, or um, have other people accommodate you? It, um, I'm a brand new person, um, as far as advocating for myself, I am the type of person who, um, usually molds themselves to their, to other people around them, right? Into the surroundings, you know, um, if everyone wants pizza with pepperoni on it, even if I hate pepperoni, fine, everyone gets pizza with pepperoni on it. I'll figure it out. You know, that's been me kind of still is me, but I'm working on it. Um, but now I'm like, Hey, you know, light's too bright. Can we, can we just turn it down a little bit? You know, I, I don't, you know, do you mind if I sit over here, you know, you're just kind of being loud when you're getting, you're just gonna, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm able to vocalize more about what's going on and feel okay about it. Like, look, this is you, this is bothering you. Would you rather just say this a little bit right now and be accommodated or have a complete meltdown later because you've let all these things build up all day? Um, I now proactively accommodate myself because usually I just bear it. You know, you just, I'm supposed to be able to handle these things. So I'm going to handle them, you know, just do it now. I don't leave my house without my headphones. I don't leave my house without shades. You know what I mean? Like, oh, um, you know, I make sure that I have my safe things with me, like my deodorant, because that's, that's something that I have to have with me. <laughs> I, that's my personal little thing. <laughs> Even if it's like zero degrees outside, it can't be musty. That's my thing. <laughs> but, um, but I used to feel shame about a lot of those things. Now the shame is starting to break off. Um, I'm able to talk about it more openly and, and joke about it. So now I know I'm starting to feel um, more comfortable with who I am. Like, this is me. I have ADHD. I'm autistic, but I'm also an artist. I sing. I'm a great mother. I'm a loving wife. There's so many things that, that come together that make me who I am. Autism covers all of that. ADHD covers all of that because that's my brain. You can't really take that away from anything. But um, my self-confidence now is no one loves me more than me. 
I would say like, no one right now loves me more than me. And that has not always been the case, but now knowing who I am and how I am and why I am has given me grounding that I've never had before. My, I felt like my feet were always slipping from under me. Like as soon as I thought I knew I figured something out, it, nope, that's not it. Um, but this has really put some roots in me and I feel like I can take off and go anywhere, you know? That is beautiful. And I love that that is, that is the outcome of understanding yourself. And you, and just to go back to the phrase that you used, previously is like you feel human and I feel like this is a common experience not just with autistic people but with highly marginalized people in this society is that we are made to feel less than human because of the constant shame and the constant um, external pressure to be perfect which perfect is just a synonym for the white colonial mindset and what they deem to be perfect it's not actually something that is the default for humanity, but we've been ingrained with all of this that whenever you diverge from it, you just feel like you're not even a whole person. And so I, I want to thank you for putting it that way and for kind of illuminating that this diagnosis doesn't have to be the end. In fact, it's actually the beginning of truly coming into knowing who you are and reconnecting with your true self. Yeah. It's been a true gift, a gift, really. Um, I I don't think I would have made it much further without it. You know what I mean? Like if if I had, it would have been a huge, I would have continued to struggle. I still would have been in the depths, not understanding why, confused, just the confusion, (laughs) you know, just knowing there's, there's something there. I don't know what it is. Um, but now that I know it's just been glory and glory and, um, uh, what's been really bothering me lately (laughs) is, um, autistic parents feeling like their child's life isn't going to be much because of the diagnosis. Um, I had uh, a person in my life um, who I told that I was autistic to, who was trying to help me, but in helping me because they have an autistic child infantilized me and were like, well, you're autistic. So I I know you're going to need a lot of help doing this. I know you're going to need a lot of help doing this. I don't, I don't need that, that help. Here's what I do need. Just do these things. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to do this too. And I'm like, no, I don't need you to do that extra. Like, do, do this, you know, and they would talk to me about their kid. And I was like, hey, they can be and become anything. I said, who they are right now, they're still a child. I was like, I'm a 35-year-old woman. I'm an adult. Like, a child is a child no matter what, you know, neural situation they've got going. Don't think that an autism diagnosis puts limits on who a person can become. Period or what they can accomplish. Once you start thinking, oh, because they found out they're autistic or because they know they're autistic, they're gonna be hindered in this way. No, it's only gonna make them grow. As long as you give them the space to grow, they can grow. Perfect point. Yes, there is. So going along (laughs) with um, the kind of phrasing that I use, the face of autism, is just the stereotypes and the fallacies and the misconceptions that we have around it, primarily because it's only historically been studied in white cishet males. And when it was studied in them, it was studied as a deficits based um, or it's defined by its deficits as opposed to showing the differences. Right. And that is, I think, in my opinion, the biggest thing that we can do to start to change people's perception of autism as a whole is to stop looking at the differences as deficits. And then that will help autistic children or children who are diagnosed with autism in their in their youth to be empowered to become their own person as opposed to being conditioned or shamed out of being their authentic self. So I'll bring this up because it's a little controversial, but 
I know you really. Uh, within the actually autistic community, we kind of feel on the same page here. Organizations like Autism Speaks are extremely dangerous to the autistic community because they they purport themselves to be allies, but in reality, they are rooted in eugenics and the erasure of autistic people yeah. by operant conditioning, trying to basically train us like how dogs are trained to stop being our authentic selves. And what you said previously about this being the answer that helped you to stay alive, to want to be here yeah. and to thrive. I just don't understand how they don't, they don't get it at this point that we don't need you to try to make us go away. We need you to accept us and appreciate us. Right. Right. It's like, I, um, I have a son who's neurodivergent and I teach him your, your brain is your brain. This is how, this is how this works. I was like, I'm here to, uh, um, sorry, I got stuff going on. Uh Oh, sorry. My sister was trying to call. (laughs) Um, I got, um sorry i lost my train of thought with her trying to call well you were talking about your son yes so i'm like your brain's always going to be this way but this is how the world is outside this is what they're doing let's come up with a way figure out the best way for you to accomplish this goal not necessarily the way everybody else does it but okay you need your room clean how are we going to do this you know Maybe you can't just go in there and do it. Maybe you do piece by piece. Maybe today we do this part. Tomorrow we do this part, this part, this, you know, let's go through um, experiments, you know, what works best for you, that sort of thing. Not like you have to do it this way. This is the people, how people are doing it. They're going to look at you weird. No, we don't care about that in this house. We care about, are you happy? You healthy? Let's not go crazy trying to be perfect. You know, my house is a mess half the time. We do our best. (laughs) Laundry is always a problem. Um, But we don't make it a moral, a moral failing. That's so important. That is so important. Um, Going back to what we were talking about, like with the, the idea of perfection being based off of white colonial standards. Right. Um, that has been the downfall of so many people burning themselves out. Again, whether you're autistic or not, just being in any kind of marginalized community, trying to achieve this level of perfection that even the people who put that standard in place don't even hit has led like, to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that has led to so many people just feeling like they are not human, like they are not worthy of of accommodating themselves, shrinking themselves, be, feeling like they're too much. Like, I know for me, I always felt like I was too much, like, and that I just needed to, I became a fawner and a people pleaser because I felt like, oh, well, my needs don't matter. Everybody else's does. And for too long, that that kept me from understanding that I I can say no, or I can walk around with my headphones on, or no, I don't have to participate in this conversation just because you want me to. Right. Right. Like, um, just the people pleaser thing. Like, I completely understand that everything I wanted to do was just making someone else happy. Like, I told one of the conversations where I was the catalyst. I was having a conversation with my wife and I was like, I wake up every day and what I try to do is just make you as happy as possible. Like, I don't ever want you to be irritated with me or think I'm too much. And she was like, why? And that why just, it paused me. It was like, well, why? Why am I, you know, putting all this energy into like regulating her emotions all day? She didn't ask me to do that, but I'm doing that. Why? That was a, that was a long few months of (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) breaking some things down. Um, And it was just, I I didn't want to be left alone. I didn't want to feel like I was unlovable. I didn't want to feel like I was an alien failing again at being a good human, you know? Um, but now I'm at uh, my fuck it phase where, it's like, um, you know, this is who I am. And, you know, I'm not an asshole, but it's like, Hey, I, 
I need these things. Can you provide those things? No? Yes? Okay, well, I'm going to at least put it out there that this is what's bothering me. This is what I need instead of holding it in and trying to tiptoe around. Um, when I can just be direct, and I am a direct person. This is me naturally just saying the thing that comes out of my head instead of rotating what I want to say 500,000 different ways because it may possibly offend you when I'm not trying to be offensive. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up because I actually wanted to step back a little bit. I know you brought up the fact that you were at a different job when you realized that you were autistic and that you had to leave that place. And I kind of wanted you to expand on that only because um, I I don't know if it has to do with the fact that you are not just autistic, but different the way that your autism presents and how it may be perceived as you being a uh, a black woman or not. But I I feel like it probably was, but I would like to hear from you, like what exactly was about <laughs> figuring out that you're autistic that made you need to kind of escape that situation. Ooh, actually, that question goes better with the job be- right before the job that I found out I was autistic. The job right before was when I was really trying, I was really figuring out that something was really, there was something there. That's when I knew there's a diagnosis here, but I don't know what it is. Um, and I was working uh, for a company, working for a clinic. Uh, and I was doing my job, getting things done, but the way I was doing it did it line up with exactly how mm, management wanted me to. So I was getting the outcomes, but my process was not official. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, so she had, you know, an issue with it. I was like, hey, you know, this is just kind of how I get it done. You know, the work gets done, but, you know, you're not going to see it here. You're going to see it here. And she kind of had a problem with that. Um, so I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this because if you want the work done, this is kind of how I have to do it. If it gets done this way, it's going to take me three times as long. So I just kept doing it the way I wanted to do it because she had her process. Um, so then something happened. We had a meeting about like a time clock situation. And my question was, okay, so if you do your investigation and it comes out on this side, like what happens? Like, what's the next step? And me asking that question, she kind of like, shifted herself like I was combating her when I was like no like I really don't know in protocol if this happened what's the (laughs) yeah you were literally asking a question not implying anything so she just straight up fired me and I was like oh well okay I was like you know what I was having a lot of trouble there anyway ended up at a job where I was we had like three employees it was me and like a doctor and a chiropractor And having that job gave me the time to research because I didn't have a lot to do all day. I was just reading about autism all day long um, and ADHD all day long. And job was so understimulating um, that it was causing problems with that. Like there was nothing to do all day and it was driving me insane. (laughs) So I was like, I need something where there's some structure and there's things for me to do, but not uh, too much. But yeah, um, I still see that manager from time to time, (laughs) but I still cut my eyes at her. (laughs) Yes, she, um, but what I found out about that manager actually um, before is that she didn't, she didn't like me. Um, I had a coworker who was a white woman. And anytime we had a meeting, that manager would address my coworker, but never address me. Never. Um, she would demand that I do things, but she would never ask that I do things. She'd be like, Desiree, go do this. But with my coworker, she's like, hey, do you have the time to maybe, da 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 you know? And I would point it out to my coworker. I was like, do you see that? She was like, I didn't see it at first, but now that you keep pointing it out, I was like, she, and she's like, you know what? She didn't want to hire you to begin with. She wanted to hire an older white lady. And I was like, oh, interesting, interesting. But you know, Everything works out the way it's supposed to work out. I got my experience from that position. Um, I learned a little more how to handle management um, as a lower employee in that position by having her as my manager, but I would never go back. (laughs) I would never go back as long as she was there. (laughs) I do not blame you. Yeah, and unfortunately, like, I feel like, oh, goodness, I relate to that so hard. Um, 
just because like when I was in a corporate environment with a bunch of older white guys and young white guys who were playing the game, that that was what initially, that was my biggest catalyst was to figuring out that I was different because I was automatically seen as this rude arrogant bitch when all of, when all I was doing was being helpful and supportive but I wasn't kissing their asses and I didn't pretend right. like they were like the most amazing people in the world and um that's so hard because like you, like we're we're told there's a lot of um, contradictions right we're told that you should just be yourself but that they don't actually mean that they mean you should seem natural in performing the role we want you to play and Absolutely. I think as neurodivergent people, um, we just are radical individuals, right? Like even before we understand that we're autistic, we know that we're different and society tries its damnedest to shame us out of being different, but we just seem to not be able to help it. And this, the diagnosis, at least for me and from what I'm hearing from you, has been that missing piece to unlock the acceptance part for ourselves and not just acceptance, but self-love. And I think that's so important right. to share. Absolutely. Absolutely. That has definitely been the key. Um, you know, like as far as this being like eccentric and, and out there and like different, you know, I'm an artist, so I've been able to kind of hide behind my my artist wall, you know, and I when I was younger, I spent a lot of time in white spaces. Right. So I'm different, but maybe it's because she's black. You know, maybe it's because she's just been around uh, white people her whole life. Maybe it's just because, you know, she's a Navy brat. And she's moved from different places. So she's experienced different cultures that they would always find a way to uh, rationalize away my my quirks, <laughs> you know, my my neurodivergent <laughs> symptoms. They're like, oh, she's just this, oh, she's an artist. You know, artists are just like that, you know. Um, you know, she's she's just blunt. You know, her whole family's blunt. She, she just she just says what she says. You know, don't be offended by it. It's just a thing, you know. A lot of my friends I hear, um when they have their friends come around, they say, like, she's blunt. Like, she's going to say what she's going to say. You kind of have to just, sometimes they say, look past. I'm like, no, don't look past me. Hear me. <laughs> Hear me. Because I'm saying what I'm saying. And I mean what I say. If it comes out of my mouth, I meant it. Now, you might not have received it the way that I meant it, but I meant what I said. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, so Excuse me, I said it. I'll take it. I'll stand 10 toes in it. If I said it, I said it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. And that sometimes gets us hemmed up when we're in white spaces, right? Because um, normal, like, okay, so you know my whole thing, I'm deconstructing neural, right? So I right. made myself that because I had to deconstruct so many interactions that I had with white cishet affluent men who kept having such a strong reaction to me when I was just being honest and straightforward and being authentic. And so in that process, I was able to deconstruct not only how my brain works, but how their brain works based off of their reactions to what I would say. And so I say, I like to say like that gets us hemmed up a lot because if you are a direct communicator and you are literal and you're speaking to someone who has been conditioned to read subtext into everything, on top of having racial biases, you're always going to be misperceived and then have their misperception projected onto you. And perception is reality, right? So if you are right. in predominantly white spaces and you have gotten this reputation of being difficult, being loud, being angry, being arrogant, it's almost impossible to change people's minds, especially if the people at the top are the ones that are disseminating this message that you are a problem. Right. Um, so this, now that I'm thinking about it, hmm, I'm going to sit with this, this story I'm about to tell you a little later. Um, <laughs> but my stepfather, the one that raised me was a white man. Um, and I think he knew I was neurodivergent before anybody else kind of figured it out because I wasn't following the rules of white society, which he knew very well. 
Um, so he would sit with me when I was like in third grade and like talk to me about eye contact and practice eye contact with me because I struggled with it so much. He would, um, you know, work on my handshake, my posture, where, where I looked when I did certain things. And he would like, he was teaching me the world. He's like, this is how people are going to perceive you. You need to like get this together. Like if you want to get somewhere, you can't be doing all this, you know, all this, like you can't be looking everywhere. You gotta have a strong handshake. You know, people have to think you're sure about yourself, the way you're moving. No one's going to talk to that. Um, and you know, it, he essentially taught me masking like broke down masking for it. I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. I need to practice these things. And um, I was like, he would, you know, tell me practice talking in the mirror. I would go in the bathroom, talk in the mirror. How do I look when I'm talking? Where am I looking? Like practicing everything. Um, Because he knew what it was supposed to look like. My family, my black family never cared that I didn't look him in the eye. Did not because it's not a thing in the black. Like, we don't look each other in the face all the time. We're talking, we're looking everywhere, we're talking to story, cooking whatever we're doing. It doesn't matter where you're looking as long as we have that verbal contact, you know? Um, but for him, if I wasn't looking at him, who was I talking to? <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, definitely. Even, you know, for me, it was right in my own house. You know, it was in my home with me. I wasn't, weird for me to step out into society and these things happen because I live with it every second of my life. You know what I mean? So it was a while before I even knew this is different. Something's yeah. different here. And uh, you bring up several great points. The first one I wanted to talk about though was um, because, because that standard has been impressed upon so many people and has been like shamed into us, there's a lot of internalized white supremacy, white supremacy, even in black households. So I grew up in a household where like my mom would, she taught me those things too. And I was raised by two black parents, but my mom would impress upon me all these things. Like you need to be like this. You need to be like that. You need to be X, Y, and Z. And that's because of how she was conditioned. It's like, well, you're not going to be accepted. She's a dark-skinned Black woman. She always felt like I'm being professional when she does a certain voice or I'm being this, that, and the other. And we recently had to have conversations where I was like, mommy, I had to point out to her, I was like, mommy, your, your voice sounds completely different now that you're talking to this person. You realize that, right? And she's like, no, I'm not being fake. I was like, I'm not saying you're being fake. I had to explain to her what masking was. And that blew her mind. That blew her mind. She's in her late 50s. And it, it just started to dawn on her that this is not how I actually talk. It was an automatic switch that she was not trying to do. But it had been drummed into her. And I was like, Mommy, I only recognize this now in you because I had to recognize it in me. And a lot of these things right. were just conditioned into me that I had to be a certain way to be acceptable. But if you have to change yourself and who you are to be accepted, that space is not for you. And this is why we're seeing that the more we come into ourselves that we have to create our own community because we're never going to fit into the wider society's view of what is normal. And yeah, we're not, not, we're not, we're just not, because we were divergent. That's, that's the whole thing. We're not, we don't think the same. We, our language, our words are the same, but our language is different. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're able to speak with each other in a way that we don't have to uh, uh, put on aspersions or put on the five different levels of what this one sentence means and which one do I mean this time. It's like, no, we can have a direct conversation. Um, but with that, because um, it used to be a problem for me. It's like, all, all these people have all these friends. They can call up anybody all the time and just go out and do whatever. And I'm like, why can't I have that? I want that too. And I had to sit with myself and I'm like, you don't really like to leave the house that much. Who are you going out with? <laughs> like, why do you need a hundred friends to sit at home and text on the phone with? You really need like three or four. <laughs> you know? like, so, um, I had to be like, I don't have any friends. So I was like, no, I do have friends. I have, you know, three or four friends that I've had since high school that, you know, before they knew I was autistic, knew I was Desiree and just who I was. And 
they accepted me as as I was when I didn't call for a year because I was in, you know, um, burnout, you know, when I called a year later, like, hey, what you doing? Come over. Let's, you know, like nothing had happened. Those are the kind of friends that I need that I can just do those things. And I'm like, they still love me. They don't hold it against me. And it takes a long time to find those sorts of friends. And I'm like, if I need those friends, they're not going to be uh, all the time. I'm not going to find people like that everywhere I look. Those are friends I'm going to come across every once in a while. It's going to be every decade or so. Someone's going to come along and fit what I need for me as a friend as a community, people I can build with. Now, I can't do everything with everybody, but my circle, my network, I know now has to be very intentional. Very yeah. intentional. That was a diff- that, that definitely was a hard lesson for me to, to learn was, because um, I do have very all or nothing thinking. And I've always been a, my heart is open, like led with an open heart chakra. I love, like my default is to just treat people with kindness. Like you have to have done something terrible to me for me to feel some kind of way or judge you, right? And um, learning about the differences and how I communicate and how other people communicate made me realize how many relationships um, I had been in, whether it was romantic or or friendships, where I was being taken advantage of and I didn't even know it. And so that was hard to reconcile with, but learning that I'm autistic and learning boundaries and learning what actually works for me has helped me to understand that, okay, firstly, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Some people can only play certain roles in your life And I don't have to cut everybody off that doesn't meet the standard of what I'm looking for or how I am a friend. But that's really difficult when you know that you give your all and people were just taking advantage of it and they didn't actually like give you the same that you gave to them. Um, But it's also a lesson that I'm very grateful to have learned, you know? Right. Everybody can't be everything. You know, like everybody can't fill all the the requirements I need in order to fill from a friendship. That's why you have like multiple friends. My wife can't give me everything, you know, that I need, but she gives me most of the things. You know, that's why I wifed her. (laughs) You know, and you have your friends and your family and and other people around to kind of. That's why community is so important because one person, a few people, can't be all of your support. It's just they they can't and you have to be um, but not everybody can do everything. So it's like I have people that I can call to go out for drinks for, you know, if I need to go out and just release some steam. You have those people. I have the people that I can call when I need to have like a deep, serious, no bullshit conversation that I know are going to like tell me like it is. And I can really get into the trenches with them in that conversation. But I can't have that same conversation with my drinking pals. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I, but I also know that I don't, there are certain people who, in order to have a friendship with them, they require a lot emotionally. And if I know I can't give the amount of emotion and time and effort into that relationship, I I tell them like, Hey, I know this is what you need. I'm not going to be, and that's my bluntness. I was like, I, I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to hurt you. I can't provide this thing that you need. I can see that you want this from me, but I, I'm not available for that. I'm available for this. If you want to keep doing this, we can and not have my feelings hurt when they say, no, I need this. And if you can't provide this, then we can't be friends or we can't have a relationship. You just have to understand. <laughs> I know your own self, I guess, at that point. Absolutely. And that that even goes that goes for anybody, no matter what your neurotype is. I think that's an important lesson for people to learn is that it's okay to advocate for yourself. And you don't have to just because our society always keeps putting all of these um, shoulds on us. Right. You should be doing this. You should be with this kind of people. But if that isn't making you happy, then you need to be able to stand up for yourself and be like, you know, what? I know this is what you think I should be doing. 
But what I would like to do is this, or it doesn't feel good. It doesn't edify me in any way to stay in this situation, to stay at this job, to stay in this relationship, to stay in this friend group, because even though this is what I am supposed to be doing, I'm miserable. I don't feel like I can be myself. I have to mask. And that's another thing. I'm glad we came back to that. I'm sorry. I'm like, ooh. No. I, I'm like, my spider web thinking um, had me go off on a tangent, but <laughs> going back to masking, right? When you told, when you said that your stepdad basically taught you masking and that he was a white guy, that made me think of how, like, it's not just neurodivergent or autistic people that mask. Everybody masks and they may say, oh, it's code switching or it's, this, but no, masking is when you, suppress hide or alter parts of your personality to gain greater acceptance and that's what everyone is doing at all times until you start to unmask and become your authentic self and i think and i want your opinion on this i think this is why so many people are rejecting the increase in people understanding their neurodivergence and seeing it as a threat yes absolutely they are okay (laughs) Let me lean back into it. Yes, everybody's masking. Everybody is masking to fit into this idea that we've come, I don't say we, that has been come up with by some people at some time as what is the norm. You have to, this is what we're all trying to achieve. This little Perfect little circle right here. If you step outside the circle, we got to slap you back into the circle for the great, the group or whatever, this herd mentality. We don't have the the space for anybody to be outside this, this little container, right? Nobody really fits into this container. Like no one actually fits in here. So they're like, well, I'm doing my best to fit in here. You need to be fitting in here too. What makes you think you're so special that you don't get to, uh, that you can't, you don't have to follow these rules like me. I'm following them. You know, I've had my butt kicked for not following these rules. So I'm going to kick your butt because you're not following these rules. We're just passing down the same BS. It's like, who cares about this circle? Like if no one fits in it, why is it here? Why am I keeping a pair of jeans I haven't fit in for 10 years, thinking maybe one day I'm going to fit into them? Throw the jeans out, buy a new pair of jeans. You know what I'm saying? Cut the slides up, stitch them up so they fit well. Like, stop trying to fit into these too tight jeans. I'm sorry. I didn't go off. No, you did. That girl, I'm over here like I could float out of my chair right now with the accuracy of that statement. Girl, when you said that, you know what it reminded me of? I, um, so in the last position I had at my former job before I had to quit, I, um, I had went from reporting directly to the vice president of this one department and I can't, okay, so let me step back. I was in customer service, but when I was in customer service, I was an individual contributor. So I was an advocate and then I became a senior advocate and then I moved out of that department and I went to a more traditionally corporate environment. Within that environment, I realized that I'm a, I'm neurodivergent and I couldn't stay there, but I loved the company and I wanted to stay. So I worked to go back to my old department, but I came back in a leadership capacity. So I was no longer an individual contributor. And so once you're in leadership, it doesn't matter if you're in customer service or not. It's still that corporate structure. So mm-hmm. the vice president of that department is a Black woman, okay. but she's a Black woman who has fully bought into this whole corporate structure and respectability. And I remember at one point, yeah, I know, right? It's terrible. So she's not really an ally. Like, yeah, she may be a Black woman. This is why I don't really do the identity politics thing because we may wear the same external uniform, but if our values are not the same, then you're not really on my side. And that's what happened. So she's this very accomplished, very achieved Black woman. She's the vice president of the whole department, you know, blah, 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 blah. But when I was doing my interview process to come back to the department, I met with her and I remember she asked me, she was like, well, why would you want to leave a position where you're reporting to a VP? And (laughs) on the inside, I'm thinking, because I don't care that I'm reporting to a VP. I don't care about what I'm doing. I'm bored and I don't value this work. 
Right. Um, but what I wound up saying was something along the lines of, oh, because I really care more. I, I, this is where I belong in customer service. This is what I genuinely love to do, which is true. But it had it hid the fact that I'm like, because I don't care about your title. Like your title right. doesn't mean anything to me. And so once I came back, I realized like she didn't like me. She always had her eye on me. Like she literally will always like side eye me when she would like walk past my desk. And it was because I wasn't kissing her ass. I didn't look up to her. Like she was something to be lauded or to be achieved. Like, I don't want to be you. Just because I have the right. capacity to be you because you see my work and how I do, just because I could do your job doesn't mean I want to do your job. And doesn't mean I'm going to walk around here and pretending like this is the thing that I need to be striving right. for. And I was perfectly happy in the role that I had. I didn't need to be anybody bigger. I even had my old boss, the VP of the other department. He was like, you know, you could be a manager one day. I don't care. I didn't. Exactly. Like, who cares? Like, you know, being a manager, having this title and what, sitting in more nonsensical meetings just to stroke your ego. Like this whole thing just is so performative. They are so tightly tied to hierarchy. You know, we don't care about hierarchy like me, you, the VP, the CEO. We are all people like to like I'm going to talk to you like I talk to them like, you know, I only now because I know they care about the hierarchy, you know, to try to play that game. But I don't care about it. You know what I mean? So it's like if you don't follow the hierarchy structure, you're a problem. Uh, you were talking about, you know, your boss being all into like respectability politics. and oof, oof, oh, mm. <laughs> all it is is just pinning your success to your proximity to whiteness and why is my success pin on my proximity to my oppressor i don't get it i don't get it why would i want to be over there <laughs> i don't want to be with them because then you start to take on the mentality of your oppressor and then you start oppressing it's just a cycle i don't want to be a part of that cycle that system and the respectability politics of the not wearing the bonnet in public or your house shoes or you know all, like all of that is just noise it's just noise it's like why aren't you more like white people and it's like because i'm not a white person <laughs> Period. Exactly. Like, needs and lifestyle than they have. My hair is jacked up right now. Am I going to walk? Like, no, I'm not going to take two hours, five hours to wash my hair, do my hair. I'm going to throw a bonnet on. Okay, so you don't see how jacked up my hair is. Or maybe I just got it done and I don't want to get it messed up. I'm going to wrap it up because y'all are not worthy. Okay, y'all did not pay for this show. I'm gonna go get my Wonder Bread and some bologna. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. But because our society has been so conditioned to believe that this is the standard, the standard, anytime you diverge from it in any way, you're going to get some kind of flex, some kind of feedback. And um, and that's that's one of the reasons why I am so happy. Like it's it's gonna sound weird, but I am happy to be in the position that I am in in this society because being at the bottom of the totem pole, like we both sit at every intersection. We're women, we're black, we're queer, we're disabled. Like pretty much Ooh. the most marked, but that gives us the clearest view oh. because the further you get away, the further you are, or I'm, I should say the closer you are to that quote unquote standard the less likely you are to see things for what they really are and the more likely you are to just continue to uphold it because you feel like it's normal. And I've, I've said this so many times, just because it's normal doesn't mean it's right. Ooh, say it. Say it. Say it. All the atrocities in history were normal. Were they right? No. <laughs> like no, they were happening every day. Everyone was participating in slavery, and you know, like not to it was in it. It was normal. It was part of your day to day. But was it right? No, no. That's a Ooh, yeah, we, that's it. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. 
who child and that's all I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like I swear, like I think that's a, a really good point that we can talk about is like just because something has been normalized doesn't mean that it's right. But because so many people, because the way hierarchy works, right? Guilt and shame and fear are their three main tactics to force compliance. So this is my theory, right? So many people walk around with a huge amount of shame, a huge amount of guilt, and in constant fear of not being able to survive because the people who hold the key, the gatekeepers to all the resources, want you to be a certain way. They need your blind compliance for you to stay in the cycle that keeps them rich and keeps them happy and keeps them fed while keeping you miserable, right? And so when they encounter someone like you, when they encounter someone like me, when they encounter a radically individualistic person who is okay, not just okay, but thriving in their own identity, they treat us like a threat because we are a threat to their way of life. If more people start to see that not only can you be your authentic self, but you can be happy and thrive and, you know, live a good life. Oh my God, like clutch the pearls. And like, you know, like that is going to topple their system of blind compliance and people working for them to advance themselves and not genuinely express who they are and be happy. Right. Exactly it. Like I... It's, it baffles me that we all have to be the same to be accepted. And it's like, that's, that's ins- insanity. Like, that's, I don't know if it's just like I'm an artist or what. It's just the differences. It's what makes life beautiful. Why would you just want to meet another one of yourself? You don't want to have any other new experiences you don't want to see any other types of way to live like het cis monogamous like nine to five two kids and a dog maybe a cat that's all there is to life it can't be it can't be that is the most boring thing i have ever heard of in my life It sounds like saltine crackers and mayonnaise. It's just, it makes me want to (laughs) cry. Yes. (laughs) Oh, soda cracker ass life. Like for real, like whenever I see that, it makes me sad actually, because I've come across some people where like, I feel like I'm very discerning and I can see now, especially nowadays, I can see through the cracks, right? And- I've seen some people who have such beautiful potential in their souls, but they're so beholden to this system that they reject these beautiful parts of themselves because they need this acceptance from the greeter group. They don't know how to live without fitting into this box. And I'm just like, this has been my motto for a while now. I have one life. There are no do-overs. Do I want to spend the rest of my life living according to someone else's rules when at the end of the day you're probably still not going to be fully accepted you're going to continue to suppress who you are and live your one go around on this earth according to everybody else's expectations for you is that really what you're choosing to do oh no you can't you you, and okay so with that You get the extra little sprinkle of religiosity on top. You're evangelism, you're God, you know, you know, I was raised Southern Baptist. There's no shame like Southern Baptist shame. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I knew from like, I, I remember I was 10 years old. I was in my room and I had some sort of thought. I don't know. I thought, you know, I, I, I wanted to kill somebody. I don't know. Something like 10 year old. But I remember like just bawling because I knew I was going to hell. Like I just knew I was going to burn in eternal flames for eternity. Literal thinking, like literally I'm going to burn (laughs) for eternity. And I was like, I have got to get baptized like two (laughs) days. I'm going to hell. I was like, my 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 cousin's been baptized. She's going to go to heaven. I'm going to go to hell. I need to be. Like, I got to do this. 
And growing up, you know, preacher's kid, my grandfather was a preacher. Both my grandfathers are preachers. My father is a pre- just church and all the time. Um, so everything was just shame. You're going to hell. And then society was supposedly following these godly rules. These rules are not just society's rules. These are God's rules. OK, not only are you not fitting into society, you are shaming God. Oh, my, how could you shame God? What? And so I had to I had to leave God because God was so wrapped up in society and societal rules and man's rules that I had to completely leave it where it was, find myself in my own divinity to come back to God. It, oof, it was crazy. <laughs> So like, and now I'm like, God is none of that. God is me. God is you. God is this love and interaction. God is growth and harmony. It is peace. All that other stuff you putting on top of that. I don't know who that is. (laughs) I don't know what. But putting God on top of your man-made rules also adds this level of, I got to bring everybody in. Like, you can't be like that. Oh my God. Because I feel that same way too. I, I completely understand. Like you want to go out and you want to be a lesbian. I get it. Sometimes I like girls too, but we can't do that because that's in the face to God. We can't, we can't do that. So I'm going to bring you back and save you from yourself. Okay. From eternal damnation. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to put in some legislation. We're going to put in some legislation to make it harder for you to do this because we want to keep you close. We want to keep you close to God, you know? And it's just... <laughs> Uh, a Russian doll of bullshit. It's just a Russian doll of bullshit. Oh, goodness, girl. I could talk forever about the impacts of religiosity and spirituality, especially when it comes, because a lot of this stuff, right, is our westernized culture. When you step outside of this American imperialism, colonial mindset, and you look at indigenous uh, populations around the world and how they practice spirituality, even here on this stolen land, when you look at the original people of this land and how they communed with the land and how they understood that God was within everything, every piece of creation, including us as people, are all extensions of the divine, and how when the settlers came over, they literally forced through through violence, Pause. fear, shame. But nuts came over. <laughs> Continue. Continue. <laughs> Girl. Um, but no, like you you get what I'm saying. It's like as soon as they came over, they imposed their way of life of being and they said, oh, this is savagery. Like, the projection is crazy for me. Everything that they projected onto the indigenous people of this land was actually true of them. They were the actual savages because they came and killed, raped, and pillaged. Meanwhile, the people here in their different nations, there were different tribes, different nations, were able to live in relative harmony because they understood the value of community. They understood that every living person, no matter their differences or the outside, the different ways that they practice their their ceremonies the way it looked didn't matter but intrinsically we all were people and that is the in my opinion that is the crux of why so many of us who unfortunately fall prey to the like colonial mindset and these standards shame other people into compliance because like you said earlier if I did this then you need to be trying to fit in the circle and how dare you not try to fit in the circle when they should be seeing it as thank you for coming to liberate me thank you for coming to open my eyes and seeing that I have been forcing myself into compliance with something that doesn't actually exist there is no perfection right Exactly. And that's why you understood why Harry Tubman had a rifle. Like, that's why you, you, because yeah, not everybody wants to be saved, right? You put it out, out there, and you're like, hey, there is a whole way of life out here that is completely different than the way you're living. There's a whole way of thinking out here that is completely different from what your mind can even grasp. You know, so like, I, me as a neurodivergent person, as an autistic person, I cannot grasp what it's like to be an holistic person to understand how that brain works. That is so confusing to me. 
I don't understand like the layers and levels and everything that they have. I can never understand. Don't. I won't even try to understand at this point. I used to. I'm not going to try anymore. Um, other than you know, just simple communication. But that doesn't mean that I think of them as less of human beings. That I think I'm better than them because my mind works differently, and maybe I can get to some conclusions faster than they can. But they can get to certain conclusions faster than I can. You know what I mean? Like we all have something to bring to this table of life. Like you said, we only get this one go round. And, you know, I'm going to go even deeper and say, we only get this one go round this way. Like, I don't know if, you know, reincarnation is a thing. Whatever happens after I die at this point is none of my business. Okay. I'm going to live the best of my ability, the happiest I can, the easiest I can right now. And I believe the best way to do that is to spread love and acceptance. Even if I don't like you, I accept you. Even if I don't believe the same things you believe or think the same ways you think or have the same religion you have or think of God the same way as you think does not make me or you less of a human being, less moral, less worthy of love, understanding, um, accommodation, acceptance, all of that. You know, we're just here doing our best, trying to survive, trying to not die, trying to eat every day, you know, a good meal. <laughs> that, why make it any harder? Why stress yourself out being upset about what I'm doing? You know what? Just chill on. Let's just be easy out here. Absolutely. That's that highlights a fundamental difference in our normal types, like in, in regards to equity or seeing everyone as equal on equal footing, as opposed to having a supremacist type, um, you know, like where somebody has to be on top and somebody has to be at the bottom. No, we can just you can live your life your way. I can live my life my way. And as long as you're not doing something that harms me, I don't have okay. anything to say about what you're doing. Like all of these anti-trans bills that are coming out here. My my question is, why does it hurt? Why does it bother you so much what other people are doing when it literally does not affect you in any way? What you're telling me is that it does affect you in some kind of way, some way that you're not comfortable with with expressing, some way that you want to fight and you're going to externalize your shame onto other people because maybe you're attracted to a trans person or maybe you have thoughts or you feel like you were trans, but the shame and conditioning of society has worked so well on you that you will turn that internal pain into external hate. Correct. Correct. This is how there's an insecurity there, a shame there. This is, you know, they're like, why don't call me a cis woman? I'm a woman. Like, you're not a woman, you're you're trans. And I'm like, adjectives, words, like these <laughs> these are things like someone putting an adjective on the word woman does not stop you from being a woman. Now, if it does, if there's something that like then you gotta work through that. Like, what is it? that's stopping you from feeling like a woman truly no matter what anybody else says because someone can come up to me and be like you're a man okay i know i'm a woman <laughs> what what is what does that do now you're not gonna be like I'm, I'm a woman you know you call me if a man if you want to we can have an argument about it but like it doesn't stop me from being a woman you know, um, this bathroom situation, you know, I'm in Tennessee, that whole drag show with the children, um, uh, legislation that wanted to go through, thank God it was unconstitutional, so we don't have to deal with that, but, you know, other things are coming through the pipeline. It's just constantly having to fight distraction, because I honestly feel like, why, why is this even a thing? Trans people have been part of the zeitgeist since the beginning of people the beginning of people why all of a sudden now is it like well i don't like them they're disgusting but wh why wh why why <laughs> you if you cannot i have not found an answer as to why yet no one has told me why in a way that makes sense logically i have not received that answer i'm waiting if anyone's got it let me know dm me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Girl, that's a perfect <laughs> note to, to actually wrap it home on is why. I want people to ask the why question a lot more because too many things are an automatic response. People get triggered. Yes. They just are following the script. But I wish that more people would just ask why and take it more than one layer down because going back to religiosity really quickly, you say why and people will just fall back on what God says it's not. But why? If you even go that second layer into why, then they get the cognitive dissonance starts whooping their ass and they don't know how to answer it. And then they just dig their heels in. And I just wish that more people would not take offense to that question, really, truly examine it because too, too many of us are just living based off of a script, these automatic responses, and we're not challenging things. And because of that, you're living this saltine soda cracker life and you're upset and fighting everybody who decides to be a Ritz cracker or decides to be a club cracker or something just with a little extra seasoning on it. You're just mad. Yeah. Right, because I'm a Ritz cracker girl. Okay, put me a little goat cheese on it. I'm going to have a fun time. If I get a little <laughs> glass of wine, ain't tell me nothing. Okay. Period. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Desi, this has been... This has been such a great, great, great conversation. I did want to kind of wrap it up with just a few um, different things. I want to ask you if there are any initiatives that you are currently supporting or any parting words that you may have for people who are just starting out with their journey of self-discovery who need support or who are looking to kind of be reaffirmed. Um. I don't have any initiatives right now that, that I'm I'm fully behind. There are some that I'm reading up on and, and starting to get involved with, but I don't want to put them out because I don't know too much yet. Okay. But as far as parting words to those who are just discovering, welcome, first of all, welcome. <laughs> uh, secondly, it's a rough road. All right. But on the other side, it is glorious okay it's not linear you're gonna have bad days where you hate everybody in your past you have days where it's gonna be the most glorious but keep going keep advocating for yourself learn who you are truly and at this point don't let anybody tell you who you are you know who you are believe it believe it That was Desi, the artist. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And if you did, make sure you show Desi some love. I'm going to be leaving links to uh, where you can find Desi's socials and make sure you're reaching out, following them and giving them some love. And I want to thank you guys once again for stopping by and spending a little bit of time with me today. Make sure you come back next week for the mid-season finale before winter break. You're not going to want to miss that episode. And in the meantime, make sure you're following me at deconstructing.neuro on TikTok and Instagram. Also at T Jamaica Pope on Instagram. You can find links to all of my projects at my website, tjamaicapogue.com. And if you are looking for some comfortable, stylish, neural spicy threads, then you want to run over to the Neural Spicy Bodega and pick up your Neural Spicy gear today. Support a Black-owned, small-owned business, Black-owned, woman-owned, small business, and, um, you know, help your girl out while also looking mad cute. Love you guys. Stay safe. Until next time. <laughs>